This episode is brought to you by the Shop 1 in 5 Pledge. We believe that when you purchase from a small online or offline business, your dollar goes further. Hey friends, Mina and I created the Shop 1 in 5 Pledge, and we're inviting you to take it with us. It's a commitment to make one in five of your purchases from a small business, online or offline. It's a way to make an impact together where and when it matters most. Because the truth is, your purchasing power matters now more than ever. Head to shop one in five dot com to take the pledge. Make that commitment to shop one in five of your purchases towards a small business. We also invite you to shop the directory if you don't know where to find other small businesses. It's right there on the page. And we're asking for you to share the pledge. Imagine if each of us told three to four people about the shop one in five pledge. It would be an incredible and life changing for so many small businesses. Tell your friends, your family, and your social network. It costs nothing extra and makes a world of difference. Our purchases have the ability to change lives. Okay, let's jump in. Welcome to the Product Boss Podcast, where we help product-based businesses grow their sales and improve their strategies. Hey, everyone. I want to introduce you to my co-host and biz bestie, Mina Kunlosita, an Amazon guru that has built a multi-six-figure product-based business. In introducing the other half of the product boss, Jacqueline Snyder, she has helped launch and grow over 500 fashion apparel and accessory brands, even one of her own. And together, we share our inventory of secret weapons that will help you dig deep and do the work it takes. Are you ready? Let's build together. Hey friends, Jacqueline Amina here, and today we have a very special interview with a billion-dollar product boss. Today we have Jamie Kern Lima. She's the co-founder of It Cosmetics and author of her new book, Believe It. She co-founded It Cosmetics from her living room and grew it into a top-selling makeup and skincare brand. After growing her product business for over eight years, she then sold it to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion dollars. Yes, you heard that right. It was making Jamie the first female CEO of a brand in L'Oreal's 100-year history. Jamie is a mother of two, wife, entrepreneur, author, billion-dollar business success story, thought leader, philanthropist, and champion of women. Today, we have Jamie on to discuss her new book, Believe It. Jamie writes that so many people think they are alone in their struggles, when really there are so many women who are undergoing the same or similar journey, which is why we fully believe and is why we tell our listeners all the time that they are not alone. Jamie feels her book was meant to help everyone on their journey to really trust themselves, know they are enough, and then believe they are enough. We're so excited to have Jamie on. Jamie, thank you for being on the show. Let's jump into the interview. Welcome to the Product Boss, Jamie. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Jacqueline and Mina. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) We're so excited to have you. This is such an honor and a treat. You are the ultimate product boss. So we all know that a physical product business is hard and you have to deal with the product development, the sourcing, fulfillment, sales, and all the things that come with physical goods. But you are proof that you can build a global brand from home with a family, all while working in partnership with your husband. Can we go all the way back on how and why you decided to launch a product-based business and enter the cosmetics industry? Yes. And all of those things you just mentioned are so hard. (laughs) So Uh if anyone listening right now is like, wait, she did all of those things. It's like, and anyone struggling or feeling stuck or like super over their husband or their partner, (laughs) any of those things, it's hard. It is hard. Um, Yeah. You know, I thought I was in my dream job working in television and interviewing other people. I love other people's stories. I had no idea I would start a product-based business and build it to a billion dollar empire, go through the exit process, which was wild. But really it all started when, you know, I got, a, a, I had a problem that, that I couldn't figure out how to solve. I got a hereditary skin condition called rosacea. And for me, it gets really bright red and bumpy. And, and I would be anchoring the news live and, and hearing my earpiece from, from my producers. There's something on your face. There's something on your face. You need to wipe it off. And, and I knew there was nothing I could wipe off. And, and I just started doing my research 
on the product that eventually launched, which I didn't know at the time, but I started uh, buying everything I could get my hands on from drugstore makeup to department stores, expensive stuff to the pro makeup artist lines. And I had this big aha moment in two ways, which I think anyone who runs a product-based business um, can connect with this. And, and part of it, if they haven't done this part already, I, I really recommend it. But I had this big aha moment where I realized if I could actually figure out, like, like I had this gut feeling, if I could figure out how to create a product that worked for me, I bet it would help a whole lot of other people. Um, uh, but I also thought I was in my dream job. And I was like, oh, but you know, my gut kept telling me <laughs> I'm supposed to figure out how to launch a product-based business, how to figure out how to create a product that works. Uh, but my head kept saying, um, oh, but you're not qualified and you've got no money and you've got no connections and you know nothing about the beauty space and you're in your dream job. So I went through this really tough season of kind of um, self-doubt, I guess, because I thought I was in a, a season of setback. In, in my career, I didn't know if I was going to get fired every time I'd be live on the air. I didn't know if I was, you know, I would have thoughts like, am I, are viewers going to change the channel? And But I kept having this gut feeling like I'm supposed to take this, this chance. Um, and so on my honeymoon flight to South Africa, I, um, I wrote the business plan to this this company to it cosmetics um with my husband we got back uh decided that sometimes in life knowing when to let go of a dream so i thought it was in my dream job is is as important as, as when to go after one and we both quit our jobs and just went all in i had no idea you guys no idea how hard and i've worked really hard my whole life like i've been a denny's waitress i've bag groceries and push grocery carts in it. Like I've done all the jobs. I had no idea how hard it would be to be an entrepreneur to figure out how to launch and then run and then execute on a product-based business and build a team and do all the things. Um, and I'm a little happy I didn't know what I didn't know because <laughs> I didn't know, I don't know if I would have I've taken that big jump. I mean, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Um, and and the last part I just want to say about this, that I think is really, really important um, for anybody doing a product-based business when they launch, or maybe they can do it now, whatever phase they are in their business is, you know, we hear so many people talk about the your why and identifying your why for what you're doing. There's so many great books about it, great thought leaders. And as you guys know, when we walk into businesses or read about businesses online, we always see a mission statement and kind of why they're doing what they're doing. And, you know, now I'm able to look back at the past 10 years, now that I've met tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, and I can identify a big thing. I, and by the way, I've done so many things wrong, which is partly why I wrote Believe It, to share all the things in my, in my book, because I, I want people to feel less alone and more inspired on their own journey, especially if they're having tough times. Um, but one of the things I realized so many people do wrong and don't make it because of this is they create a why for their business, their product-based business or their goals or whatever they're doing. And they, they stop at a why that sounds really, really good. And that when they share it with other people, it sounds good. And they actually don't go deep enough to something so meaningful to them that they can lean on it when times get tough. And what I mean by that, and then I'll wrap up, it's probably the longest answer ever. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm like on my third cup of coffee this morning. Um, the, the thing, a million things I did wrong, which I'm super happy to talk about those too. But one of the things that I did right and how we took like an idea from my living room and, and endured three years of hundreds of no's, hundreds of rejections, and eventually built it into a, to a billion dollar business is, Early on, when I identified my why, um, you know, I realized that when, when I realized I couldn't find anything that would work for my skin, I realized I was like, why can't this doesn't make sense? There's hundreds of great beauty companies. Why? And millions of concealers and foundations. Why can't I find something that works? And I realized, oh, I've actually never seen anyone that looks like me in all these beauty ads on TV and in magazines my whole life. And I realized that, you know, as a little girl growing up, I would see those commercials and I would love them. I'd aspire to be like them, but they always, deep down inside, they always made me feel like I wasn't enough. And so I had this, this moment happen. I just want to share because I think everyone needs to do this work in their own business is like, I could have just said, oh, my why is to create a product that solves my own problems and works for me. Or I could have 
been bigger and said, oh, I want to create a product that helps millions of people and boost their confidence, right? And if I would have shared that why with everyone else, they would have been like, that's amazing. And and I would have just stopped there. And I did want to do both of those things. But one thing I did right that I would encourage everyone to do who's listening um, to us is to take their why for their product-based business and literally peel back the layers and go way deeper to like the why beneath the why. And, and, you know, for me, it became like, yeah, I want to create a great product that works. And, but I also want to shift like the whole definition of beauty inside the beauty industry. I want to create a product, but I want to use you know, models that are real people, all ages and shapes and sizes and skin tones and skin challenges and gender identities and everything. And I want to call them beautiful models and mean it and, and try to shift shift that definition of what, what beauty is for every little girl out there is about to start doubting herself and every grown woman who still does. And it was this deep why that came from a point of pain that I still feel, still feel as an adult. And I would just encourage everyone to do that deep work because there were so many times where I got the most painful rejections and the, what I felt like the most painful setbacks and didn't know how this business was going to work. And if it ever was and got down to no money and having that deep why that I was like, Oh, this has got to change. Like this has to happen. That was, you know, it was a why so much bigger than myself that fueled me so many times. I was able to lean on that so many times um, because it mattered so much more than my own stuff. Do you know what I mean? So I just encourage everyone to really do that work of like the deep why beneath the why for their, for their product-based business. I love that so much. I think that that's one of the things that we, even as women, and even we're seeing even more so now, you know, raising uh, the next generation and everything, what that could look like and, um, what that could be the beauty industry and, and all and everything it encompasses now. You've really evolved that into something else now, even by having a product that has carried that message throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the questions I have, because we do have so many people that, like you said, have self-doubt and have the mindset uh, limitations and um, really feel maybe sometimes it feels like your why is not big enough or maybe feel like you're not uh, smart enough or, or, you know, brave enough or all the things. Um, do you think that that's something that you, that confidence that you speak of, was that something that you always had though? Were you born with that? Or is that something that, you know, your husband has helped you with or, or what was it that really, that you can say that came from? Yeah. And really fast too, just to throw this out there, your why could be, I want to break a generational cycle of complacency in my family. So I'm going to do things different in my own life or for my own kids. It can be something real personal like that. It doesn't have to be, I want to shift a definition in an industry, right? It can, it's just as powerful. It just needs to be real deep for you. Um, and something that, that means more to you for, you know, something bigger than yourself, but it could be real personal inside your own family too, just to throw that out there. Yeah, no, I have not always been confident. Like the entire, it's funny when, when I, I just wrote, you know, Believe It, my first ever book. And a lot of people initially thought, oh, it's a business book on how to build a business. I'm like, no, my, you know, or it's a story of how I went from Denny's waitress to billion dollar entrepreneur. And I'm like, well, that's part of my story. But my real story is a girl who went from not believing in herself to learning how to believe in herself and not trusting herself to know, knowing how to hear her own intuition and trust it and literally doubting I'm enough to try to break through that barrier self-doubt to know I'm enough. And, and part of why I wrote Believe It is because I think it's not just my story. It's a story of so many people out there right now on their own journey of doing that. And, you know, Mina, I believe that self-doubt kills more dreams than anything else. I think especially as women, imposter syndrome is a really, really big thing. And one thing I want to share on that is it's a journey. It is a lifelong journey. Anyone listening to us right now who's like, oh, maybe I'm not qualified or maybe I didn't, you know, I don't have the right this or that or whatever it is. First of all, I think the most important thing to know is that um, A, it's all crap we make up in our head. But B, (laughs) you're not alone in those thoughts. Like imposter syndrome, the thing that was most healing for me is now I've had the the blessing of meeting some of my greatest mentors, right? Mentors that I like from afar, right? So growing up, I'd watch Oprah in my living room every single day and as a little girl, you know, and, and, and now I've had the 
great honor to, to meet her. She was the first person that read my book cover to cover and all these things, right? And but so many other awesome women I've had the blessing of meeting. And here's the thing I've learned is they all to this day feel the self-doubt and feel imposter syndrome. It's a it, and when I've learned this time and time again, it makes me feel like, oh, okay, it's not just me. Like there's like if you're if someone's listening to us right now feeling self-doubt or feeling imposter syndrome or questioning if they're smart enough or qualified enough, like eh, you're not alone. Everyone has those feelings. Even people I could never imagine would have those feelings because it looks from the outside like they've accomplished everything. And I think number one is just knowing there's nothing wrong with you and you feel those things. You're not alone. It's so normal. And it's total crap we make up in our head. Um, all those things, right? So part of our greatest journey is how do we break through that? How do we how do we overcome that? And that to me is more important because by the way, I can talk for hours about um, protecting your IP and about setting yourself up for acquisition and about manufacturing stuff. And I'm super happy to. And what I would say is what I believe is more important than any of that is uh, what's going on in our mindset. I believe that's more important than any of that. I think there are people every single day with brilliant products and brilliant dreams and brilliant callings that literally talk themselves out of their own truth and not to be dramatic, but never end up becoming the person they're born to be because here's the deal. Every one of us has things that it's so much easier for them to be so much louder in our life than our own intuition and then hearing our own calling, right? And what I mean by that is, so I think that learning to hear our gut and learning to trust ourselves. And for me, like a lot of people that have different faiths or whatever, for me, when I pray, that's how I hear God is in my intuition, right? For some of us, we're like, oh, you know, we, we connect with the universe or source or, you know, everyone has different, different names for it. And we all hear, you know, that intuition inside of us. And I believe when we can hear ourselves and then make the decision to trust ourselves, that's the victory in life, right? And not selling your business for a billion dollars or anything else. It's it's actually learning to hear yourself, trust yourself, and then and then and then moving forward in that direction of of your own calling. And here's what I see happen so often is that you know a lot of people say like, oh, I haven't, you know, because now I'm getting I, now that my my book just launched, I'm getting these messages every day with women saying like. I realize I haven't heard my own gut in a long time. Or, you know, when I hear my own intuition, sometimes I confuse it with my self-doubt in my head and I don't know which is which. And so one of the big things I talk about in the book is this idea that our own self-doubt is so loud that sometimes we can't hear our own intuition if we don't intentionally learn to turn down the volume on our own self-doubt and turn up the volume on our own knowing. I believe every one of us has a knowing. I believe our knowing is always right. Um, and, and here's the other problem. A lot of us have partners or friends or family or people we love so much. And we, I don't want to say make the mistake of doing this. Out of great intentions, we share our dreams and our ideas with them and what's going on in our business and this and that. And the problem is they all typically will mean really well, but then they give us advice or, or feedback or their thoughts through the lens of their own fear and their own experience in life. And all of a sudden that is so loud and that turns into self-doubt in our own head or lowers our own vibration. Um, then we have, like in my case, lack of proof of success around us. Like for three years, I didn't know, we didn't pay ourselves for three years. I didn't know we our business was going to make it. Like, like there were times where, you know, we got down to under a thousand dollars in our company bank account and personal bank account. I didn't know we were, we were teetering on, on going out of business at any moment for years. And when we have that happen and we have people rejecting us and experts, we want to put on a pedestal telling us, thank you so much, but you're not right for us. We don't think basically they're saying you're not enough and we don't think we'll make money off you. So we're not going to carry you in our stores. That's basically what they're saying. And I heard that over and over and over from all the people I put on a pedestal. Like in the beauty space, it was for me, it was Sephora and Ulta Beauty and QVC and department stores. Every one of them said no for three years. And it was hundreds of no's. And so we have all this stuff going on around us. And that can get so loud that we don't even know what to listen to or how to hear our own gut. And so, you know, a big 
And again, I've done, I made so many mistakes building it cosmetics. A lot of times people just see the brand it is today, right? They see like, oh, because as of this moment that we're talking, it's the number one uh, largest luxury makeup company in the country, which is crazy because, and to be the biggest beauty brand in QVC's history is crazy as well. Because for three years, all of the retailers said no. And all of them said, we don't think you're the right fit for us or for our customers. And I just, my point is when, had I listened to that, <laughs> had I listened to all that noise and the self-doubt that it so easily creates in our head when people reject us or when people aren't buying our product online or, and we don't understand why, like the biggest thing I did right was I literally would get still, I would hear my own gut and it said, you're supposed to be doing this, keep going. I kept feeling that and I made the decision to trust it. And by the way, when I was a news anchor, my gut said, you're supposed to get this dream and you're supposed to launch something new, right? But with It Cosmetics, despite those three years of rejections, and when we get rejections, sometimes we think, oh, I was wrong. My gut was wrong, right? But I kept checking in with it. I kept saying to keep going. And those are the moments that define and change our lives. Amazing. And, and so there is a lot of self-doubt in our community. We always tell them that their only limitations are their mindset, right? And we're, mm -hmm. we are trying to prove to them that a product-based business can hit a million dollars and beyond. I mean, your proof, because yeah. there's a lot of that mindset of six figures, right? They, they kind of cap themselves. We tell them they create their own glass ceilings oftentimes, but we're all in this together. We're doing it together and we're, we're showing proof of that. So when you were getting the rejection, because we have a lot of people that have been doing this for a lot of years and they're feeling like, you know, is it me? Is it wrong? And I understand the self, the, the gut check. Did you take feedback, like product feedback? What did you do? Because I know then after three years, yeah. you finally got on QVC. So what would you tell our product-based business owners about that feedback and what to listen to, what to shift and change, and then perhaps what to just stay true to? Mm, yeah, that is like literally the million dollar question because <laughs> Here, here's the thing. Everyone, so, oh gosh, I'm gonna get fired up. First of all, everyone has an opinion. Here's what I learned, you guys. You, you, you probably know this too. But I didn't know this for years. And if I would have learned this sooner, I would have saved myself a million nights crying myself to sleep. Is that so often experts, like touted visionaries, head buyers, heads of departments, they're well intentioned and amazing visionaries, but they, it's almost impossible for them to see something succeeding if it's never been done before. And if you are doing a product that's new, or by the way, even in a crowded industry, I, I entered the beauty industry, which is an industry of giants, and people say it's impossible to break in and all those things. And there's a million concealers and foundations, but I was doing something different and authentic to how I wanted to do it. So a lot of people, if you're doing a product that's already been done before, but you're doing it authentic to you, then by definition, it's new, it's novel, it's never been done before. And experts, even the most touted visionaries, literally, I feel like that it's almost impossible for them to think something's going to succeed if it hasn't been done before. And if there's not that social proof in their mind that says, oh yeah, that's going to make you money. And so how to learn that sooner, it wouldn't have hurt so bad for years when everyone said, change this, change that, be more like these brands doing well for us right now. Here's what I want to say. You guys, I've been told a million times now, change your packaging. No one will buy makeup from real people. Uh, don't use yourself as a model. Um, here's what's doing really well in our stores now. This is what we suggest you do, right? Over and over and over and over. Sometimes that feedback is a gift. Sometimes, but you have to check in with your gut and go, is this right for me? Is this right for my secret sauce, my authentic brand DNA? Sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, I got feedback sometimes saying like, oh, I can't read the size of your font on your product box. You have two seconds of consumer attention. And if they can't, if, if you make them do the work instead of you doing the work for them, like, and you know, they need to know in two seconds what this is and why they should care. And if they don't know, then you're asking them to do the work of figuring out what your product is. And that's not going to, so the first time I heard that feedback, I'm like, oh, right away in my gut. I'm like, that's brilliant. And I increased the font size on my box. And I was like, oh, this makes sense. I don't want to ask my customers to do work to figure out what I'm trying to sell them. I want to do the work for them. And so right away, that feedback was a gift, right? But then all the times when I got other feedback, change this, change that, and it just didn't feel authentic, 
I didn't listen to it. I turned down. Like there were times where retailers, by the way, even L'Oreal, we met for three years, right? Before they bought our business for $1.2 billion for three years, they gave awesome feedback. And they also suggested some changes that I thought, I know that this is what other brands are doing, but it's not right for me. And because I stayed true to the stuff that made me odd or different or not fit in, that's why we created something of value. When L'Oreal ended up buying, I mean, they have, what, 40 plus companies in their portfolio, beautiful brands, but we weren't doing anything like what they were doing. So because we stuck to our oddities or our uniqueness or what what other people said wasn't going to work, that's why we ended up creating something of value where L'Oreal ended up buying us because we were different than their 40 other brands. We complemented their portfolio. We didn't compete with it. And I just think like, I'm so glad I didn't listen to all the feedback to change what we were doing. Um, the other thing I'll say is, I and product-based uh, entrepreneurs will understand this, but I mean, I have so many stories that I share for the first time ever and believe it about what happened when a, com- a bigger competitor knocked us off about what happened when a bigger competitor literally bought our formula illegally. I talk about all these things and how I got through them and the lessons I learned because I believe we all have a secret sauce that's authentic. All research shows you cannot connect with another human being unless you're 100% authentic, right? And that includes our customers. That includes our community. And so when we get tempted to change who we authentically are, our authentic vision for our brand, to me, that's the biggest recipe for failure. Like I talk about this idea a lot and believe it about authenticity alone doesn't guarantee success, but inauthenticity guarantees failure. And the last thing I'll say about that is I would, you guys, once we, so we grew to over a thousand employees, right? Which is crazy because for several years, I couldn't pay myself. And then I eventually hired my best friend who was my maid of honor, who was six months pregnant when I hired her. We did every job, all the scrappy and glamorous, everything. But we eventually right? Grew to over a thousand employees and I was able to hire people far smarter than me in the beauty industry to come join our teams. And here's the thing that would ended up happening. They would continually show me things that were working for other brands or for other people. But I knew this lesson that if you, if you change who you are, you're done. If it's not authentic, right? So the thing I would say over and over, just in case someone needs to hear this in their own company today is my employees could probably repeat this to the point where they got so sick of hearing this, but they would show me what so-and-so was doing or this or that. And I like seeing it, but I would always say to them, our biggest threat to our business isn't the competition. It's if we get distracted by it and tempted to dilute our own authentic secret sauce. And, you know, we had retailer after retailer say, do this, it's hot, do this, it's new. And, you know, our DNA, our brand DNA was, no, I want to create a hero product that has a repeat purchase rate. I want it to be so good that, you know, because I feel like you, if you sell something one time, that's a product. But if people love it so much, they buy it a second time, a third, that's a brand, right? So we stayed focused and I got good at disappointing retailers and saying no. And that was, that's really hard when you're raised to be a people pleaser, like I am, like so many of us are. But I protected the the brand, got good at disappointing retailers and focused on, okay, the most profitable thing and the best thing for our customers is to only launch a product when it truly works, when it's so good that they'll re-buy it over and over because it makes their life better. And those kind of focuses on discipline is really hard to do when you have no money and (laughs) you want to like get into these stores. Um, But it's super, super important. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it just, it hits home and it speaks so much to what I think our product bosses need to hear. So Mm -hmm. Jamie, thank you again for being on the podcast. We love your book. Everyone go out and buy Believe It. um, And we can talk about it in our community and then really build our confidence together. Oh, thank you guys for having me. And also just a couple of things. I, I'm donating 100% of the proceeds from the book um, to Feeding America and Together Rising. I'm really just doing it because I think like, we're, and I love your show, by the way, because literally we're all in this together, right? Mm-hmm. Being an entrepreneur, being a product boss, it's freaking hard. Yes. <laughs> I feel like when we really share the stories behind the stories, my hope for, the, for Believe It is that it saves people a whole lot of nights crying themselves to sleep, saves them time, saves them money. But also when we come together and share stories like what you guys do on your show, I feel like that's when we all rise higher together. So I just want to say thank you for that too. And I'm super honored to be here with both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you. 
Thank you for being here and listening all the way through the Product Boss Podcast. If you love our show and it has helped you in any way in your business, would you mind doing two things for us? Subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode and leave us a review. Reviews help other product entrepreneurs know that this is the place to be to grow their businesses and realize that they're not alone. And we know that you all know that a five-star and honest review helps you sell more products to more people. So you know that your reviews help us reach more listeners around the world. Remember, what we give is what we receive, and we are all about helping each other in the Product Boss community. We are all in this together. We would be so appreciative of you if you could take the time right now to subscribe, leave a review, and even share this episode on social or someone you know so we can impact more lives. And remember, subscribing means that you will get notified each time we release a new episode so you never miss a thing. You have helped us grow and climb into the top 10 of all marketing podcasts and together we can keep climbing. Thank you, friends. And remember, there is room at the top for all of us. This episode is brought to you by the shop one in five pledge. We believe that when you purchase from a small online or offline business, your dollar goes further. Hey friends, Mina and I created the shop one in five pledge, and we're inviting you to take the pledge with us. It's a commitment to make one in five of your purchases from a small business online or offline. It's a way to make an impact together where and when it matters most, because the truth is your purchasing power matters now more than ever. We're inviting you to take the pledge. If you head to shop one in five.com, the link is in the show notes. And when you get there, please make sure to share the pledge with your friends, your family, and your customers. Let's invite everyone to take the shop one in five pledge so that we can all use our purchasing power to change lives.